Okay, folks, this is James Bach, and I am here to interview Lee Hawkins, who hey, I have been uh, tangentially aware of for uh, a long time. I keep seeing your name pop up in, in LinkedIn, and uh, I've seen some of the things that you've uh, said on various forums about testing, and uh, the thing that immediately uh, riveted my attention is your uh, love of mathematics, your education in mathematics. So I'm particularly interested in hearing about that. But why don't you start by telling us who you are and about your background? Sure. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to have a chat. That's good. Um, so I'm Lee Hawkins. I, I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. So I've been in various testing roles since the late 1990s. So I've done some hands-on testing work, test leadership, test strategy work, I guess, at team and organisational level. Um, I've, really everything changed for me in about 2007, after I'd been in the industry maybe seven or eight years when I did RST uh, with Michael Bolton, which was pretty mind-blowing experience actually. I, I'd sort of learned everything I, I was doing in testing from basically the people around me in the company I was working in. So I thought that was the way it was done. Um, and hadn't really looked outside of that very much at that point. So it was all test cases and test plans and signing off and all this stuff that I thought was important. Um, so I came back from RST, a bit of a change man actually, my thoughts around testing. Uh, How did you get into testing in the first place? Oh, purely by happenstance, actually. I'm originally from the UK. And I decided to move to Australia from the UK. I'd had a programming job in the UK before I before I left. Uh, came to Australia and literally I was just looking for a job. Whatever job arises in IT, I'll, I'll take that, at least get myself going. So the first job I interviewed for was actually a technical writing job. So I did the interview for the technical writing job, but in the same company, they said, oh, we're also looking for testers. Do you want to interview for that? So I'm like, okay, I'll interview for anything. Um, interviewed for that job, didn't get the technical writing job, did get the tester job. So I'm like, that's cool. I've now got a job in Australia. That's my first job. Mm -hmm. I'll give this a crack for a few months and see how we go. Um, and I stayed with that company for 21 years. 21 so, years? <laughs> One yeah. company? <laughs> so it was uh, it was a pretty lucky break as it turned out. So doing lots of different things, but within that same company. Uh, Did you get so, into yeah, coding? I, uh, I didn't get into coding again. Uh, I, I, my experience in the IT industry in the UK before I moved over here was was actually in programming. I was, I was a Lisp programmer of all things. A Lisp programmer, okay. Programmer, yeah, on some very sort of early artificial intelligence expert system stuff. Um. So again, that, that was my first exposure to the IT industry was that job programming in Lisp, um, which I now realize I got that job because no one else wanted to do it. But um, that was fun. Um, it was an interesting sort of domain, that project. Um, but that came to an end and then I decided to move here and it just happened that who knew that there weren't many opportunities for Lisp programmers in, in, in the late 1990s in Australia. So... You were never drawn back to programming? You didn't miss it? I didn't miss it, actually. Um, I, I did some you know, basic SQL and scripting type stuff, but I, I, didn't, I didn't really miss that aspect of it. But, but what I'd found it, in that job as a programmer, my first job in IT as a programmer, um, I, I knew nothing about programming really before that. And... But the process of learning the language stuff, uh, and then it sort of became, that wasn't the interesting part anymore. Right? It was actually solving the problems that you were trying to solve was the interesting part, not the, you know, the nuts and bolts of putting together the code to do that. So I became more interested in like what problems we were trying to solve for the clients we were working for, and you know, that that translation of that interesting stuff into the actual keystrokes of the code was was the less interesting part in the end. So maybe that's why I didn't really miss it that much. Hmm. A lot of people who are into coding really like to build things. 
And I never, I, I started as a programmer too, but I was never interested in building things. I don't find that very exciting for some reason. It just doesn't attract me as much as um, solving a problem. Hmm. And once I, and, and solving a problem is part of building something, but you can solve the problem long before you finish building something. And that's when I yeah. lose interest. Yeah. <laughs> I just, yeah. Like do the rest of the work yourself. I'm 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 done once the mystery is gone, and the rest is just is just uh, sweat and yeah. labor. Yeah. I'm I want to go on to the next mystery. Yeah. Uh, for me, that's that's what's really attractive. And uh, yeah, the I other, think, yeah, I think that's exactly where the point I got to with programming in that short time too was you know, actually solving the problem was the interesting part, but sort of codifying that solution wasn't that exciting. Do you find that testing is a social activity or it, or is it not fundamentally a social activity for you, but more fundamentally a, I don't know, a technical or a learning or a problem solving activity? Oh, I think it's all that stuff. I, I see too many people who don't think it's a social activity actually in the industry. You think it is more of that, you know, here's a description of something, um, how it's meant to work and that's all I need to know. Yeah. In order to test it, but rather than looking at into that broader sort of social context of where that stuff fits. So I think it's all of those things, which is, again, what makes it quite interesting for me is that it's not just that technical bit, but it's, it's sort of working with others yeah. to understand all, all the things that are not described in that, in that more technical aspect of it. Yeah, okay. I find that testing is quite social, mm. and that's part of how I get the vitamins from it that sustain my spirit. And I think I was I wasn't getting that as a programmer, but I think I was doing it wrong as a programmer. I think programming mm -hmm. can also be social if mm -hmm. you have the right kind of team dynamic going on. And I was always alone when I was programming, so I just got more and more depressed. Uh, and and but whenever when I was in a testing context, I was always reporting to someone, talking to someone, getting information mm -hmm. from someone, feeling like I'm helping someone, and and I I found that I needed to, th to, I needed that team dynamic. I needed the social, uh, the feeling like I was part of a, of a community and that I'm an important part of the community. For me, that was uh, a, an important part of me staying in testing and not going back uh, to development. That and the mm. fact that I love mysteries and I love finding problems and that sort of thing. Are you, is that also a motivator for you as it is for so many testers? The idea, most people will say, I break stuff, which you don't really break anything, but you discover something is broken and that's exciting. Uh, you push the system into a state where it realizes it is broken and that's exciting. Is mm -hmm. that something that's the thrill of seeing failure, <laughs> catastrophic failure right in front of you? Is that something for you that is a, exciting yeah it is uh, i don't think that ever left me i think that, that's uh <laughs> particularly if it's something pretty subtle and you've you know you've had to do a lot of, right. a lot of learning or discovery or poking around in order to right get to the point anyway, where you can you, just come up and breathe on yeah. it and it falls over that's not very yeah. exciting but when everyone else thinks it's solid as a rock and yeah. you go boop and it goes <laughs> it's uh yeah. That's a good feeling. <laughs> uh, not good that they're all sad, but you know, it's good that they discovered the truth. That's the thing yes. that, that I. That's right. That, that now at least we know the truth, and that's a good feeling that we're less fooled now than we were a minute ago. So we can yeah. then we can go from here. Yeah. So I think that that kind of thinking that you're expressing there is that that's some of the, the stuff that changed when I did RST. I think if I'd have still been stuck in a, I'm going to use the word loosely, traditional sort of testing model that I was in before I did RST, you know, test cases and checking off things and test requirement, all this stuff, like th there wasn't that much creativity there for me. Um, I'm not sure I'd have stuck around in the industry yeah. if I'd still been doing that. But after doing RST and like listening to Michael talking the way you're talking now about what testing can be and uh, it, it really changed everything for me about the way I thought about it. And unfortunately, I was I was able to sort of engineer a position for myself that I was able to spread that word within my organization. It wasn't resistant to it. 
Now, in, in, in RST methodology, we talk about general systems thinking. We talk about uh, a, a lot about the nature of logic and reasoning and why uh, it is not possible to verify quality, but it is possible to test for quality. Uh, and in uh, this stuff, we draw this from general systems theory and from uh, certain basic epistemological philosophy. And uh, to me, it, that is very, all very strongly related to mathematics. In fact, maybe it grows out of mathematics. So I was excited to hear that you have an extensive mathematical education. You are a, you have a doctorate in mathematics, do you not? That's correct. Yeah. I'm wondering how has mathematics played a role in your identity and in your life, if at all? That's a huge question. Probably similar to you. I just had a real love for mathematics when I was a kid, actually, which I guess most kids don't. Um, I happen to be very good at it, um, and maybe that that's why I enjoy doing it so much. Uh, I continue that all through my sort of early learning. So it was a natural process for me to want to just keep doing more and more mathematics if I could get away with it. So when, when there was a chance to maybe study that full-time at uni, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that. It was, it was a great disappointment to me, actually, that when I started uni, I realised that in the first year of uni, you actually couldn't do just mathematics courses all year. You had to do other stuff. <laughs> really? So, so I ended up doing accounting for like nine months. Accounting? Which was painful. <laughs> I thought that's that's going to sort of have some math in it, so maybe it'll be similar. But it really wasn't. It was it was awful. Anyway, so we got past that, and then I could specialise in in, um, in the stuff I really wanted to do. Um, got to the end of that, and of course, I was I, I realised that I was always sort of maybe sort of one one step behind all the time. So when I was at school, I was sort of doing stuff, but not understanding why I was doing stuff. And then when I started as an undergraduate, I was learning things that sort of explained that stuff. And then it was only once I sort of finished my first degree and started my PhD that I really started to understand some of the later stuff I did in my undergraduate course, probably. So it was that always that building that, that sort of the foundations kept sort of building up, I guess, to to really, really understand the the a lot of the subtlety that, that there is in some of these topics when you get deep into them. And of course, by the I time I got to it affects your identity. I mean, that it affects how you interact with the world, how you see yourself in the world. Do you just think I am a mathematical man uh, <laughs> as you go around? Uh, or I probably, I, I probably did when I was doing my PhD. I think it's, it's sort of inevitable when you become so focused on such a small, a small topic like it. But it's completely specialised by that point. Right? You're in. You're looking at something that there's a handful of people in the world that care about it deeply, like you do. So it can be quite isolating in that sense, I guess, um, and all encompassing if you're not careful. Um, to 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 actually get through that process of of completing the doctorate is requires that level of focus, right? It's there's there's no easy way through it. I don't think. But how long, it, it did how long was that process for you? So my doctor took me three and a half years. Okay, that's a pretty big chunk of your life. Yeah. Does yeah. this mean that you're no longer intimidated by any mathematical thing? Nobody can snow you with numbers. You don't see numbers and run away. Uh, I think I'm that, not. That, that's done a lot to people in our industry where people throw up metrics and say, how, could, how dare you argue with the metrics? And lots of people just go, oh, metrics. We can't argue yeah. with metrics. Doesn't yeah, I? I don't have any problem arguing with metrics. I go right, right at it. But yeah. uh, so I imagine. I mean, you must. It, it must be impossible to pull the wool over your eyes with uh, I'm not, fancy I'm not metrics. Sure it's in, not sure it's impossible, but uh, I'm, maybe I'm more. Maybe it's more obvious to me when things look particularly silly. So some of the things I see. It, Around the way people measure or attempt to measure things in in our industry, just they, to me, they just blatantly make no sense. I don't know why that's because I'm a mathematician or because I've been in this industry for a while, but 
Um, but yes, I mean the the idea that you blind people with lots of numbers and charts and stuff's not not unique to our industry either. It's a it's a common tactic to to sort of intimidate people who are scared of mathematics. Right? And I, I think that could be a reason why our industry, why the testing industry is so mired in this what you call the traditional mm. you know, methods. They don't work those traditional methods, the metrics that are produced by these traditional methods are, are uh, inherently meaningless. You count mm -hmm. test cases. And uh, one of the things I do in my class is I, count, I, I compare counting test cases to counting crumbs of a cookie, large crumbs, small mm -hmm. crumbs. What if we just cheated all crumbs as if they were equal to a cookie? Uh, you get into obvious... Uh, absurdities like mm -hmm. that you can take one cookie smash it and now you have 500 cookies <laughs> and, uh, and but we do this with test cases where people take a, an idea for a test case come up with 500 tiny irrelevant variations of it and then mm -hmm. they act like now I've got 500 test cases well that's not equal to the value of those tests like maybe you have very valuable test cases, mm -hmm. maybe not. But even if you do have valuable test cases, they're not valuable for long because every test case is a question and the value of a question tends to get lower after you've asked it once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ask the same question a hundred times. It's not the same thing <laughs> as asking a, a, a question, asking a hundred different questions that might, mm -hmm. uh, that might uh, uh, be probing at different things yeah i think you're right though that that sort of rigor around the, the way you have to work as a mathematician is you know it, it makes these uh, it makes the sort of ridiculousness of some of these things stand out to you because th there is no rigor there right you, you can very easily sort of prove that those things don't make sense it's it's like it's not it's not even difficult to to point out the at least the logical fallacy or just the that the model in just doesn't make sense. Are you normally surrounded by people who are not into mathematics, or are you normally surrounded by people who are very much into mathematics? What sort of you know cultural group do you normally work with? Uh, I would say the former, actually. Um, the people who surround you yeah, respect okay. mathematics. That's what but, you mean. But they they're not. They're not into mathematics. Okay, so you're a you're you're a math nerd by your, which means you can't really use the language of mathematics to no. them of anything. No. no. You can't but, talk um, about equivalence classes and be thinking about it as a mathematical object. Uh, it's it's a cultural object that they heard about on a YouTube video, if at all, or in an IST yeah. thing. Yeah. Where they don't really, they aren't really using the term equivalence class to mean an equivalence class in any sort of rigorous or semi rigorous mm -hmm. sense of the word. Doesn't that kind of take some of your power away because you, you're sort of locked in your head because you can't get across to them? I haven't found that to be a huge problem, but I think it's like anything where you're, where you're really specialized in something and you're trying to, ex you're trying to use that specialization to explain something to someone who doesn't have that specialization that you have to be you know prepared to sort of reword that stuff to to get it across and that that's even the case in within the field of mathematics itself right like i said by the time you get down to phd you've sort of narrowed down into this tiny little thing yeah. that hardly anyone in the world truly understands as well as you do because they haven't devoted years of their life to that one little thing. So even trying to explain what you've been doing in that in that field yeah. to, to someone outside of it, which is what you have to do. My PhD was in group theory, actually, now you come to mention it. It was in group theory. <laughs> now, group theory, isn't group theory all about combinatorics? Isn't that a big part of group theory? There's a lot of combinatorics in there, yes. Uh, and it seems to me that combinatorics is one of the fundamentally useful mathematical areas mm. for testing. Combinatorial testing doesn't come up as much as I wish it would, mm. but it does come up 
in some really important situations. So have you found in your work a moment where you went, aha, and you applied some kind of wonderful combinatoric analysis, and then you then you saved the day, you did some testing that you're really proud of based on your, your knowledge of group <laughs> theory? Has that ever happened? I would love to say yes to that. I'm just trying to think. I, I, don't, I can't think of a situation where that, that's been as sort of revelatory as you're describing it. But, um, Have, has that anything like that ever happened to you where you were trying to solve a problem and you realized you could reduce it mathematically or you could uh, you didn't have to worry about something and it was your mathematical intuition or your ability to model that told you you didn't have to worry or that told you you did have to worry nothing's coming to mind actually I've, I've certainly used all pairs that's been a that's been a handy and you think the the kind of thing you're describing really surprises people I think when when you if you ask people how many cases would you need that they wouldn't say eight right they'd say no they often say thousands like, or something yeah 500 you yeah. know yeah. Yeah. And, so, and, uh, and 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 that's and that's why it's such a good learning experience because once yeah. you understand how to model this correctly and you realize oh wait it's like the birthday problem the famous birthday problem in statistics it's simultaneous yeah. probability yeah. not sequential probability that's yeah. why there's such a high likelihood that two people will share the same birthday mm. uh, in a room of, you know, X number of people. It's always surprising yeah. to folks. Yes, it uh, is. And, and that's, that's because of it's a simultaneous uh, mm. sort of, of, yeah. of thing. So I, 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 certainly, I certainly use that sort of simplification in, in my work during my PhD, actually, because a, a lot of the work you end up doing in group theory is solving sort of big matrix multiplication problems in particular um, and the stuff I was doing. And this was in the sort of mid-1990s. Computing power was a lot lower than it is now. So solving really big systems of simultaneous equations was actually pretty hard. Right? Um, once the number of variables got up there, it was, it was actually really difficult to just do that compute even at that time. So I had to use simplification techniques that seemed a bit counterintuitive to me too until, like you say, you look into this and realise that you can, you're not going to get the perfect solution, but you can you can get something that's pretty damn close and, and good enough actually for what I was doing. Um, so that was sort of melding that sort of statistical, you know, your chance of finding the right um, the right solution to these systems of, simultaneous linear equations was you, you could do that without actually truly solving them all and most of the time you, you'd get the right answer with, with with a lot smaller computation so that that was that felt a bit counterintuitive to me because i'm a pure mathematician at heart not a statistician so but um but it worked you know it was the only way i could get past some of these limitations on compute at that time in general in testing i don't think we we sort of look outside of ourselves anywhere near enough to learn from pretty much any other discipline generally. So, um, as a few people do, um, yourself included, but most people are just not on that sort of path, I don't think. And so I, I don't see people using even sort of basic mathematics or statistics in their test efforts very much. Uh, I'd like to know what your personal approach to testing is. So the thing I normally do first would be, I don't know if there's a term for it. I guess it's some kind of tour type thing. But a, a, a spin through the, the obvious sort of basic path through the thing. The UI tour? Yeah, pretty much. Um, or at least a, a, if I'm aware of what the sort of basic workflows through the thing are, just hit those first, have a look around, try to sort of, build a bit of a mental map of how that right. fits together. Um, and I'll, I'll generally jump to a mind map almost straight away for any of this stuff if, I, okay. if, I'm, if I'm new to something. Okay. Yeah, I'll just I start constructing a mind map of just finding my way around what the, the main features look like, how they hang together. That's probably my first go to document it that way and then try to 
sort of dig a bit deeper into each of those major things that I've found in terms of the workflow. So what, what's so the what's the doing a breadth first, generally yes. speaking, yeah. uh, and you are and your initial approach is dominated by learning. You're trying to to build that model yeah. in your head. Of course, you may stumble into a bug as you go, in which case you can deal with it. But it sounds like you're beginning with a high learning activity. For sure. Yeah. Now, some people would say, I'll go read the requirements. Uh, is it, do you it, do you find that if you had the written requirements, written spec, pile of documentation next to you, that you would read it and that would be your first thing? Or do you gravitate toward play with the product if you have it? I, I would play with the product if I have it. Um, that, that's probably changed for me. I, I think in my earlier testing career, I'd have done the opposite. Because that's probably what I was taught to do. Well, that's what that was the process. You know, you understand the requirements, and then you can do the testing. Um, but now I'd, I'd probably do the opposite. I think, with the benefit of experience, for, for a few reasons, right? The, the, the requirements are not the actual experience of using the thing. So maybe I should use the thing. Um, they're probably out of date. They probably don't cover everything. But once I've done that initial sort of modelling of what the thing is and how it fits together. If there's stuff that I feel like I need more detail to understand how, like it might be in some domain I, I don't understand or something. So you know, the requirements might give me some detail into you know, what would be useful things to look for next. So I noticed that you didn't say, I sit down, read the spec, and write test cases for every user story. I noticed you did I, not say that. I, I did not say any of those words. <laughs> and, and a lot of people do. There's there's mm. thousands of testers who that that's what they would the answer that they would give. You know, mm. I write the test cases. Mm. I I write the test cases from the specifications, uh, from the requirements, mm. from the user stories. Mm. Given when, then. Yeah, I've had to reflect on that myself because that, that's exactly what I was was doing for. The early part of my testing career. How did you did you did that feel good? I guess it didn't feel really bad. I don't that whether well, it, it probably didn't feel good, but I don't think it felt it clearly didn't feel bad enough that I I looked to do something else at that point. Well, now it I sounds think, like you're trying to remember what the feeling was like. Are you yeah. quite a bit, are you quite a bit divorced from that history now? Do you feel do you feel like you really are quite different? Oh, for sure. Now? Yes, for sure. Um, this was it was a long time ago, and I think it was an artifact of, of I, you know, going into a testing job just to get a job, and yeah, I knew nothing about what good testing or bad testing looked like, so I was led by the people around me in, in that company. So that that's what you were doing. It was a rational, unified process. It was all yeah. pretty document heavy stuff, and everyone was talking about the same things. And like well, you do this, and then you write this document, you do this, and then, okay, that must be what it is. Um, so it wasn't terribly exciting, and I, you know, as I mentioned, I probably wouldn't have stayed in testing if in the long term, if that's where it was. But um, so you can imagine coming from that sort of environment to go and spend four days with Michael talking about all this other cool stuff and how interesting testing could be if you actually did testing instead of writing about. Stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. That 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 really did sort of flick a switch for me. That, yeah, well, what we're, we're always try, trying to do is to liberate the minds. I mean, here you've got all this background in mathematics, all this rigorous thinking practice. We just want to take you off the leash and get you to use mm. your brain yeah. that you have and enjoy using it and be rewarded for, for mm. using it, which doesn't necessarily mean you don't do documentation. It doesn't mean you operate in a non-rigorous way. I mean, just use the rigorous thinking that you that you know how mm -hmm. to use in an appropriate way uh, as the situations arise. But uh, the so-called traditional approach is just trying to be a Procrustean situation where it's cutting off 
your legs or it's stretching mm-hmm. you in weird ways. It's got this pre existing notion of what testing has to be, which is ignorant of learning, ignorant of how the mind works. Yeah, I guess this is slightly off topic, but it, it just disturbs me what I see in the in the market at the moment uh, around. Like, like I, I appreciate your your motivation to encourage, you know, thinking people to take up careers in testing because I think it's, it's a great place to be if you if you're in a position where you can actually do that within some organisation. But it's uh, and I can only speak to the local market, like the. The market here has just been completely taken over by automation. It's it, to actually see uh, a job ad that that wants a thinking tester to actually like yeah. interact with software and and learn about it and give useful information or something. It's it's one and well, it's one in a hundred or something. It's all autom- build automation frameworks, transition from manual to automated testing to all this stuff. It's like there's a lot of there's a lot of momentum there to to try and hold up <laughs> by talking. Well, it, about it, it, it strikes me kind of like going to a, a a convention for psychotherapists, and everyone's talking about what's the right kind of notebook to use to take notes, and what's the best kind of pen, and what about managing your office? Well, you have to manage your schedule. So here's a new scheduling system for psychotherapists. And that's the keynote is about scheduling systems for psychotherapists. Uh, uh, and someone's come up with a, uh, a better a note-taking system where you just talk to it. And uh, that way you can, uh, you, you can have it running and record your, your patients and then it will record the... None of which touches on any of anything that's mm. important about psychotherapy. Yeah. Uh, the, the empathy, the wisdom, the, the, the uh, uh, modeling of other people's systems, the attempt to communicate. None of that is touched because I, we don't know how to do that. <laughs> we don't know how to do that. And I, actually, I've gotten into, into big fights and been blackballed from various conferences because I've taken a stand and said that I think certain kinds of talks are bad. And the people who do those talks are doing bad to the industry. And well, people don't like hearing that. So they go, no, you're bad. And uh, <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> I have to tell the truth. But you realize it's, it's an obsession with a certain way of thinking, with a certain model. I'm not saying that tools aren't interesting. Oh, yeah. You know, how do we try to manipulate a GUI using a program interface. Now, that's interesting. But okay, what else do you have? Oh, 15 talks all about that? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, nobody talking about how do you know which tests to run? How do you know what's a better test and what's a worse test mm. in terms of ability to find bugs? Uh, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. But yeah, not, not much. Is out there. Yeah. I, I haven't been to conferences in the past few years, so maybe they're all different now. But when I used to go, it was uh, it was nearly a wasteland, except for a few really interesting speakers mm-hmm. and a, a couple of really interesting conferences. There used to be a uh, a conference called Let's Test. Yeah. Uh, did you ever go to Let's Test? I spoke at Let's Test. Actually. You yeah. spoke at Let's Test. Well, you yeah. are testing yeah. royalty, Lee. There you go. That might have been where I first encountered you. Actually, was was uh, well, I might have seen you at uh, yeah, at, my turn. at Let's Test. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because uh, every speaker at Let's Test was fascinating. They had a whole ethic there of thoughtful, context-driven testing. Mm. That was what it was all about. And I never saw a bad talk at Let's Test. But then, you know, it was around for, what, four years or something, and then they just yeah. stopped it. Yeah. No, it was and pretty that's... unique. It was, it was good. It was good fun. I, I was actually speaking there about my experience of uh, introducing exploratory testing into a, a Chinese testing team that we had at the time. I think so, I saw that talk. So it's a little bit different. So it was a good opportunity to, to talk about that stuff. Yeah. No, it, was a, it was a great conference. It was, it was well, a lot of fun. See... Something pretty special. I don't know. I think all of our friends, we just don't, 
we're not organizers of conferences. That's the problem. The kind of people who organize conferences are not our kind of people, maybe. Mm. So we don't get the kind of conferences that we that we want. Instead, we get conferences that are there's vendor things mm. or else they're uh, big parties where people just want to have fun instead of learn stuff. Mm. Uh, and I want to go to a conference and be challenged and to challenge other people and to have it sharpen me. And I want to help sharpen other people. Uh, I don't know of any conferences like that anymore. And I'm not going to start one because I'm not an organizer. I don't like organizing things, but I would love to help somebody else organize such a conference. And someday it will probably happen. Um, anyway, uh, Lee, thank you for your time. Thanks I enjoyed for the opportunity. myself. I hope, hope you enjoyed yourself. I did. Um, I, I'm going to keep poking you about this. <laughs> you have a contribution to make mathematically to our craft to help us help us under. I want to have a better math education. Maybe, you know, we need a study group or something to something to to uh, give me a, so a little bit of, of, of impetus some kind of peer pressure to <laughs> learn better mathematics. Uh, I think there's a subset of mm. us that need your guidance. So I hope you'll, you'll, you'll consider starting such a thing or encouraging such a thing. Um, oh, that but, sounds like uh, fun, actually. It, it, yeah. Yeah, you've, you've laid down a challenge there too. Uh, yeah, and I'm in. <laughs> I'm absolutely uh, 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 in. Uh, so, because I know I, I I need this, and I would be a very enthusiastic participant. So cool. think about it. Uh, uh, meanwhile, thank you very much for uh, for uh, joining me today. No worries, thanks, George. Cheers. Right. Bye bye.